Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hanging in there? Oh, yes. <laughs> Remember to mute uh, your audio. Oh. Um, so welcome to our final virtual artist studio tour of 2020. Today, we are featuring Lava Thomas. On this call, we will have the opportunity to get to know Lava better, and she will share with us what her creative process is all about. Thank you, Lava, for your time and energy today and for enlightening us. I would seriously be remiss though, if I did not congratulate you, Lava, for winning again to design and deliver San Francisco's monument, the bronze sculpture portrait of a phenomenal woman. Thank you. <laughs> the nine foot tall book sculpture with Maya Angelou's face and etched words, which will be delivered to the San Francisco library. Bravo and well done for taking on the city and holding them accountable. <laughs> I'm sure it was exhausting, but you did it. <laughs> so we look forward to hearing more about you and your inspirations for your artwork. Just if you could also remember, maybe if you have pieces available for purchase to show us, that would be great. But now for the true moderator, Jamie Austin of CCA, who will take it from here with Lava. And um, as usual, we will take, we will leave some time for questions at the end. So be prepared to be called on. <laughs> okay, Jamie and Lava. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's so great to see you today. I'm Jamie Austin, Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at California College of the Arts. And I am happy to help moderate this series of virtual studio visits with the 2019 Women to Watch Artists. This is our fourth virtual studio visit that we've had this year. And I'd like to give special thanks to Robin and to Lorna for your support in creating this series, uh, which we hope is a way for the group to stay connected despite this continuing stay at home order and seeing each other constantly in our, our Zoom squares this way. Um, but today I am so happy to be introducing artist Lava Thomas. Lava was raised in Los Angeles by her grandmother and great aunts who were originally from the South and spent a lot of time in her grandmother's beauty salon. I loved that in her bio and thinking about her work um, and first became interested in art during childhood visits to LACMA. And later as a working mother, she studied art at UCLA's School of Art Practice and received her BFA from California College of the Arts. We're so proud of her as a prominent alumna. Thomas's work tackles issues of race, gender and representation through a practice that spans the mediums of drawing, painting, sculpture, and site-specific installations. Obviously, the Women to Watch show is focused on works on paper, but I'm excited for her to share more of her practice um, with us today. She's currently based in Berkeley, California. And so please join me in welcoming Lava, who will share more of her work and her practice with us today. Welcome, Lava. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be here. And it's nice to see so many faces and um, folks that I haven't seen in person for a very long time, very, very long time. So it's wonderful to see all of you here today. Um, I have a presentation prepared. And so I'm going to talk about projects that I've completed selected projects that I've completed over the last five years and then in this presentation with um, the Maya Angelou project and the advocacy and activism around getting that um, finally approved last month, which was the result of over a year <laughs> of uh, activism and advocacy. So here we go and bear with me, I have my my son, who's my, my IT person. Yeah. Okay, great. It looks good, Lava. Thanks. Requiem for Charleston is a wall composition of black tambourines that memorialized the women and men who were murdered by a white supremacist at Emanuel African and Methodist Episcopal Church in South Carolina on June 17, 2015. This past summer, we marked the fifth anniversary of the massacre. Tambourines aren't usually a part of AME worship, 
But in the aftermath of the tragedy, the instrument began to emerge as a symbol of unity and healing. On the Sunday after the shooting, crowds of people took to the streets in support of Mother Emanuel Church, some ringing handbells and some playing tambourines. Nine of the tambourines are inscribed with the names of the victims in pyrographic calligraphy using a wood burning tool typically used in Americana crafts. I wanted to symbolically burn the names of the dead into our collective memory and also recall a time when the enslaved were branded. I covered most of the tambourines with black lambskin. The lamb is associated with innocence and sacrifice in Christian, Jewish, and Muslim traditions. Some of the tambourines are left blank for the countless attacks on black churches throughout American history. The tambourines are encircled with an ornamental ribbon that is often used on choir robes. Other tambourines are covered with discs of black acrylic so that the viewer can see their reflection and become part of the work, a gesture to encourage empathy. The tambourines are installed in a square on its side so that the axis forms a cross. As a girl growing up in the black church, Playing the tambourine for me was a kind of ecstasy, but here, the tambourines bound in blood red pay silent tribute to the women and men who were slain. Two years ago, I met relatives of some of the victims, Sharon Risher and her daughter, Asia. Risher lost her mother, two cousins, and a childhood friend in the Charleston massacre, and has since become an outspoken advocate for gun control. I invited the Rishers to attend a talk at the Smithsonian American Art Museum which commemorated the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. The Smithsonian arranged for them to have a private viewing of the work, and it was humbling to know that my work had found the audience for whom it was intended, and in some way contributed to the healing process for them. Looking back and seeing now, I was working on this exhibition when the Charleston massacre occurred and the grief and rage, both personal and collective was overwhelming. I responded to the tragedy by transforming the gallery into a contemplative space that evoked the prayers, resilience and strength of my foremothers, black women from the South. Looking back and seeing now combine the material and the spiritual in a site specific immersive tambourine installation which incorporated large scale portraiture based on photographs from my family archive, the serene garden setting of the Berkeley Arts Center and the building's octagonal architecture were perfectly suited to provide respite and refuge. And this shot of the gallery shows how the exhibition actually existed with lowered lights. And the studio shot on the left gives you a sense of the portrait scale and these two portraits were part of the Women to Watch exhibition at CCA last year. The portraits of my ancestors are from the early 1900s. The stories told to me by my grandmother of Ku Klux Klan cross burnings in her hometown of Decatur, Texas, left me to imagine what these women must have witnessed. I activated the portrait's gaze by painting the eyes in color as a mean to bring, means to bring them into the present. I enlarged the eyes from the portraits and placed them on the tambourines. The installation created a space where the past and present met. Theatrical lights and mirrored tambourines cast moving reflections and shadows on the gallery walls, activating the space into an immersive experience in which the viewer became a part. Viewers saw themselves reflected in the piece and the piece in turn seemed to return their gaze. And as the past considered the present, the installation asked the question, what has changed and what remains the same? Mugshot portraits, women of the Montgomery bus boycott. This project takes a contemporary look back at a powerful yet under acknowledged legacy of black women's activism through a series of portraits based on mugshots of women who were arrested during a foundational event of the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and 56. The women were part of a group of boycott leaders who were arrested for breaking Alabama's anti-boycott laws. I chose this period of American history as a site of inquiry for its relevance to the present, 
the resurgence of racial hostil hostility, misogyny and lethal violence, the ascent of white male supremacy in the executive branch, and the methodical erosion of hard-won civil rights laws and protections. The popular narrative of the Montgomery bus boycott is well known. Rosa Parks' arrest for refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger on a segregated Montgomery bus, the ensuing year-long boycott led by Martin Luther King Jr., and the NAACP lawsuit, which resulted in the Supreme Court ruling that deemed segregation on Montgomery buses unconstitutional. That narrative centers men as the principal players, as seen as this in this photograph by Don Cravers for Time Life Pictures. This project aims to expand that narrative and addresses the near absence of black women in what remains a male-centric historiography of the era. I'm looking at this period through a black feminist lens, through firsthand accounts of the black women who organized and participated in the boycott, as well as text on gender and the civil rights movement, black feminism and histories of women's activism. This project reconsiders this history. Rosa Parks was not simply a seamstress, too tired to give up her seat to a white passenger. Parks was a longtime civil rights activist, secretary and investigator of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. Joanne Robinson initiated the boycott, an English professor at Alabama State College and president of the Women's Political Council. Robinson and the WPC planned and organized a one day boycott arranging for the distribution of over 50,000 handbills, urging Black Montgomery residents not to ride the bus. Ministers of Montgomery's Black churches embraced the action, extending the boycott and elected Martin Luther King Jr. as president of the newly formed Montgomery Improvement Association. But Black women were the chief strategists, fundraisers, carpool organizers, and drivers, along with the thousands of domestic workers who refused to ride the bus financially crippling the bus company, as well as financially crippling businesses in downtown Montgomery, who reportedly lost millions of dollars of revenue. The backlash was swift. Two months into the boycott, an Alabama grand jury handed down over 80 indictments. When boycott leaders learned that mass arrests were imminent, they turned themselves in, riding together in groups to support one another, rather than suffer the humiliation of being arrested at their homes or places of employment. They seized the moment of surrender and made it their own, choosing when and how they would be photographed as part of the criminal record. Dressing well was an act of self-regard, a way to maintain what historian Danielle McGuire calls bodily integrity. Acting within the repressive limits of a mugshot, a photograph designed to remove traces of the sitter's humanity. The women took control of their representation with their self-possession, their style, even their refusal to hang the booking numbers around their necks. They actively contributed to the making of their image, speaking to the idea that a photograph is not taken, it's made. Transforming codes of criminality into representations of resistance, the portraits honor the women's service and sacrifice. And the range of emotions is striking. Ida May Caldwell's expression conveys a look of resignation. While the side eye and smirk of Uretta Affidare conveys a quiet defiance. I chose to draw the portraits instead of creating paintings because the act of drawing is accessible. We have all used a pencil and engaged in some form of mark making. Conceptually, the notion of labor is embedded in each drawing with the accumulation of thousands of strokes. The drawings are built in layers in a process that's laborious and time consuming. The materiality of the portraits is a metaphor for the fragility of this history, the ease with which it can be erased if it isn't preserved. As drawings, the portraits have to be protected and treated with care, framed and kept out of direct sunlight to prevent yellowing and fading. With the exception of Parks and a few others, we know little more than, than the names of these women. The portraits are drawn slightly larger than life size and hung at eye level so that the viewer can have an intimate one-to-one -one engagement with them. This series represents only a fraction of the thousands of women 
who were the backbone and also at the forefront of the movement. This is a photograph from when I was working on the series while I was an artist in residence at the Headlands. And here's an installation shot of the portraits as they were exhibited at Rena Branston Gallery. And two of the portraits that were included in the exhibition at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. This past May, Angela Davis spoke about how the activism of Black women of the Montgomery bus boycott continues to inspire current activism by Black women. And I quote, people assume that the Montgomery bus boycott was a product of the imagination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And of course, Dr. King emerged as a public figure during the Montgomery bus boycott, but it was Black women who organized the boycott, Black women who participated in the boycott not only black women, it was poor black women. It was black women who were domestic workers, maids, cooks, washerwomen, women. And those are the women I would like to lift up now. I would like for us to be able to imagine how it is that we are here today as a direct consequence of the collective imagination of poor black women who walked. Civil rights unfinished. This project looks at some of the unfinished work of civil rights legislation. The piece that you're looking at is titled The Civil Rights Act of 1960 Unfinished. And its proportions are proportional to the dimensions of the American flag. The beginning text of the Civil Rights Act of 1960 is written in pyrographic calligraphy on black lambskin. This work also engages the history of modernist painting, Ad Reinhardt's black paintings, as well as the flag paintings of Jasper Johns. The Civil Rights Act of 1960 was established to rectify discriminatory laws and practices in the segregated South that prevented African Americans from voting. It was enacted under President Eisenhower and was meant to eliminate loopholes left by the Civil Rights Act of 1957. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibits unequal protection of voter registration requirements, racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. And this law was passed under the Johnson administration. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law by President Johnson to overcome legal barriers at state and local levels that prevented African Americans from exercising their right to vote. The 2013 Shelby County versus Holder Supreme Court case reversed some of the voting protections granted by these laws. This body of work reminds us that 60 years later, even after reaching these legislative landmarks, our country's task to secure basic voting rights for people of color and African Americans in particular remains unfinished. And the attempts to restrict mail-in voting and attacks on the U.S. Postal Service prior to the November 3rd election and the post-election attempts to disenfranchise tens of thousands of voters in predominantly bl Black voting districts in Detroit, Michigan, and Philadelphia by the Trump administration is yet another example. And this image gives you a sense of scale. Freedom songs. This project recalls civil rights era protest songs in the African-American music traditions from spirituals, gospel, and rhythm and blues. Freedom songs were sung to inspire courage during meetings, marches, and when activists were arrested and jailed. A Change is Going to Come, Oh Yes It Will, takes its title from the song by Sam Cooke, written in 1964. Illuminated Anthem is inscribed with the lyrics of the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, originally written as a poem by James Weldon Johnson in 1900 and set to music by Johnson's brother in 1905. It was declared the Negro National Anthem by the NAACP in 1919 and was also an important anthem of the civil rights movement. And here's a detailed shot. Freedom song number five, We Shall Not Be Moved, engages the intimate and civil act of bearing witness. This piece also includes drawing of my Southern ancestors' eyes. The lyrics speak to solidarity in the face of intimidation and violence and an unyielding commitment to social justice, racial equity, and economic parity. 
Resistance Reverb, Movements 1 and 2. Resistance Reverb, Movements 1 and 2 is an immersive tambourine installation that speaks to the topic of solidarity. The tambourine is an egalitarian instrument that speaks to our common humanity. Anyone can play it without special training, and its history is rooted in cultures around the globe. The installation utilizes the tambourine as an instrument of protest and takes its visual cues from the 2017 Women's March, the pink wave of women's political agency with the unprecedented number of women who won congressional seats in the midterm elections of 2018, and also the use of pink and feminist start from the 1970s and 80s. Written on drums of some of the tambourines are fragments of political speeches by women throughout US history. Mariah Stewart, the first African-American woman political writer, Sojourner Truth, abolitionist and women's rights activist, labor leader Dolores Huerta, Japanese-American civil rights activist Yuri Kochiyama, and others. And here's a detail of the work in progress. Drawing from over 100 years of speeches by activist women, this work links historic and contemporary movements for gender and racial equity. The mirrored wall composition includes the viewer in a continuum of activism, encouraging viewers to consider their role in an ongoing legacy of resistance. For the exhibition's opening, I invited Thrive Choir and Oakland California-based social justice choir to activate the space by leading a community sing and freedom songs and contemporary protest songs. The exhibition also included a reading kiosk with books by activists, scholars, and feminists. Invoking a vision that's aspirational and inclusive, the crowd of tambourines represents a multiplicity united in solidarity, yet still retaining individual agency, power placed directly in the hands of the people. Pandemic portraits. During the shelter in place, I began a series of pandemic portraits, a commentary on masks, both as a public health necessity and a polarizing political flashpoint. The portraits also are a reminder that women of color and black and brown women in particular are on the front lines as essential workers facing disproportionate risk and death. And this is one portrait that's part of a larger project in progress. Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman, a proposal for a sculpture to honor Dr. Maya Angelou for the San Francisco Library. Some background, currently in San Francisco, there are 87 monuments dedicated to men and only two to women. The city of San Francisco is attempting to rectify this gender disparity through legislation to increase the representation of women in the public realm to 30%. The sculpture to honor Dr. Angelo is the inaugural commission. And this is a national endeavor with monuments being erected to women in cities around the country. In January of 2019, I was invited to apply. The legislation introduced in 2017 didn't pass until the following year because the Arts Commission didn't want to be prescriptive in calling for a statue and wanted to give artists more creative freedom. So the original legislation was updated to specify an artwork not a statue, provided that the artwork included a significant representation of Dr. Angelo. The Arts Commission's national call was publicized in the press, calling for a, quote, contemporary representation of the sculpture honoring Dr. Matt, Maya Angelo, which is what you would expect from a city with a reputation for being progressive. My proposal, Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman, ultimately received top ranking by a panel of artists and arts professionals in a transparent and democratic process. Two months later, however, it was rejected by San Francisco city officials. But last month, over a year later, it was finally approved by the Arts Commission. 
I'm going to share images from my presentation to the selection panel and discuss the aftermath of the city's rejection of my proposal and some of the events that led to the Arts Commission to finally approve my monument's design. Over the course of this past year, my work and voice have been at the center of conversations on censorship, representation, government overreach, and racial and cultural equity in public art, raising important questions about the integrity of selection processes and who dictates the representation of Black women in the public realm. These issues continue to reverberate at this, as this country continues to grapple with its problematic history of monuments to white supremacy and the aesthetics of conquest and domination in the public landscape. Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman introduces a new icon to the city of San Francisco with the representation of Dr. Angelo that doesn't already exist in the public's consciousness, a monument that would allow her to be seen and experienced in a fresh and contemporary way a monument that embodies her courage, her beauty, her strength, and her fierce self-possession, a monument whose formal and conceptual choices are driven by Dr. Angelo's own words, how she defined herself, her values, and the overarching philosophy of her life and work. The monument's title, Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman, is from Dr. Angelo's poem, Phenomenal Woman proclaiming herself as phenomenal in a society that persistently attempts to, content, attempts to dehumanize black and brown people required and requires still unassailable courage. Courage is the most important of all virtues according to Dr. Angelo, the foundation upon which all other virtues stand. My process began with research immersing myself in Dr. Angelo's works, interviews, performances, and reading works by other Black women writers, scholars, and artists to provide a broader context in which to think about her life and works. Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman takes the form of a book fabricated in bronze and stands as a total of nine feet. A portrait of Dr. Angelo translated from an original drawing in bas relief appears on the book's cover with her name in bold letters on its spine. The monument's book form serves as and physically tying the monument to its site in front of the library. Its scale emphasizes the vital importance of the library and reading throughout the course of Dr. Angelo's life from the young girl who found refuge in books and libraries to overcome childhood trauma and mutism, to the fledgling young writer of the Harlem Writers Guild, and to Dr. Angelo's lifelong commitment to knowledge and education as a significant aspect of her identity. The monument's clean lines, devoid of embellishment, are in harmony with the surrounding built environment, environment and reflect her view that, and I quote, the epitome of sophistication is utter simplicity. Angelo's portrait is based on stills from the author's 1973 interview with Bill Moyers, which was conducted when she lived in Berkeley. The year 1973 is significant as it resonates with today's politics. 1973 was the year that Roe versus Wade was written into law. 1973 was the year that the Nixon impeachment hearings began. By then, Dr. Angelo had achieved international recognition as an author, poet, film director, activist, and humanitarian. A true cosmopolitan, she spoke several languages and had lived in several countries in, the, in Africa and Europe. She traveled extensively and performed on stages around the world. When Bill Moyers asked what price she had paid for her freedom, the freedom to work, live, travel so expansively, she answered, the price is high, the reward is great. At some point you realize that you are only free when you belong no place, you belong every place. When Bill Moyers asked if she belonged to anyone, she answered, I belong to myself. In this, thanks. In this portrait, wearing a short Afro and hoop earrings, Maya Angelou epitomizes the black is beautiful aesthetic. This is a generative portrait that captures her human interiority and complexity with a nuanced expression that can be interpreted differently by each person that encounters it. The portrait conveys her fierceness, her softness, her strength, her beauty, and her vulnerability. 
it not only transcends the decade from which it is based, it projects a timeless presence into the future. The quote on the back of the monument and letters large enough to cover its surface illustrates how reading and information cultivates empathy and understanding, necessary qualities to counter inter ignorance and intolerance. The human drama that unfolds in literature helps us to see our common humanity with greater clarity. Dr. Angela's insistence that we are more alike than unalike is an underlying philosophy of her life and works. I write about the black experience, she says, but I am always talking about the human condition. Bronze has long been the material of choice for commemorative monuments for its association with conquest, grandeur, and permanence. My choice for bronze, however, was inspired by the Benin bronze plaques of West Africa created by the Edo people, whose indigenous metallurgy technologies date back to the 13th century. I was also inspired by Elizabeth Catlett's memorial to Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, a bronze monolith that stands in Harlem. Portrait of a phenomenal woman embraces the rectangularity of these works and situates itself in black art, not a European figurative tradition of statuary. After the selection panel deliberated on August 9th, 2019, I was informed that my proposal received near unanimous top ranking and that it would be approved during the next visual arts committee meeting as a matter of course. And yes, this is supposed to be a blank, <laughs> a blank uh, slide. Instead, two weeks later, I received a call informing me that the project sponsors preferred the second place proposal, a more figurative work, and that my proposal wasn't approved. So I did what any self-respecting artist would do. I wrote a scathing letter, which would be the first of many that I would write over the course of the year. So many working women have remained silent when subject to injustice for fear of backlash and reprisals. This is especially true for artists as we often rely on support and funding to realize our projects. I speak for all women who have been treated unjustly and in the spirit of Dr. Angelo, I will not sit silently by. I urge you not to let political mover, maneuvering corrupt a fair and transparent selection process and to reconsider your positions moving forward. And via social media, I rallied folks to attend the next visual arts committee meeting to make public comments, to protect the integrity of the selection process and to seek answers. During that meeting, Supervisor Stephanie stepped forward as the legislative sponsor of the project and rejected the selection panel's choice. She then ordered the Visual Arts Committee to shut down the project and start over, insisting that Dr. Angelo be honored with a traditional statue, even though the legislation's text had been edited to cross the word statue out. Stephanie said, quote, as I carried the legislation across the finish line to elevate women in monuments, I wanted to do it in the same way that men have historically been elevated in the city. Her assertions weaponized European aesthetics and conventions of statuary to perpetuate the systemic and persistent erasure of black women's intellectual and creative labor, not to mention undermining the democratic process by which my proposal was selected. And this was the first time in San Francisco's history that a critical mass of black women artists and arts professionals were invited to serve on a panel tasked with selecting an artist to honor an exceptional black woman with a public sculpture. I spoke out condemning the decision, along with several members of the Bay Area Arts Committee who attended the meeting, including members of the selection panel. And taking to social media, I urged the Bay Area Arts Community to write Mayor Breed and Supervisor Stephanie in protest. The story was covered by international and local press, which sparked community outrage. The hyperallergic article was picked up by the College Art Association and emailed to all of its members. So I began receiving emails from folks all over the country expressing disbelief, outrage, and offering support. That following November, 
Ashara Agandayo Gallery hosted a conversation that included Dr. Rayford, Associate Professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley, Selection Panelist Angela Sint, Hennessy Associate Professor of Art at California College of the Arts, and Dana King, an artist whose public monuments were commissioned by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. We spoke to a standing room only crowd. Community activism grew out of that November meeting, along with the creation of Sea Black Women Collective. And I've spoken about this incident during artist talks and panels at Art Practice in Los Angeles, a presentation to the National Portrait Gallery's Board of Directors, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific, Art, Pacific Film Archive, and other venues. The Arts Commission, meanwhile, issued a new RFQ for the Maya Angelou Monument in January earlier this year. Artists boycotted that RFQ or asked permission to use my images in their submittals. The new RFQ specified that applicants who had already applied would automatically be reconsidered. I wrote another letter in protest withdrawing my proposal from consideration and listing all of the reasons why. But in the wake of Black Lives Matter uprisings this past summer, with monuments to white supremacy being toppled and removed, not only in San Francisco, but around the world, monuments were back in the public consciousness. After protesters toppled monuments to Francis Scott Key and Junipero Serra in Golden Gate Park, forcing the city to remove the monument of Christopher Columbus with the threat of toppling it too, Mayor Breed called for an audit of San Francisco's monuments to determine which should be removed and which should stay. I challenged the city's monument strategy during the next Visual Arts Committee meeting in July, arguing that the Arts Commission also needed to address its mismanagement and inherent systemic racism in regards to the 2019 Maya Angelou Monument fiasco. But I was cut off before I finished my statement. Uproar ensued with members of the public calling for me to be allowed to finish, but their requests were ignored. So I took to social media again. I will not be silenced. And I collaborated with Sea Black Women Collective on a campaign to abolish white supremacy at the San Francisco Art Commission. The campaign called for the new 2020 RFQ to be suspended and for redress and restorative justice to be made for the way that the 2019 RFQ was mishandled. Based on my earlier social media activism, the campaign provided specific actions and encourage people to make public comments during the next Full Arts Commission meeting. My letter to the San Francisco Arts Commission with my list of demands can be found on their website, which included a public apology, the adoption of best practices covered in the Americans for the Arts report, cultural equity in public art, and an end to prioritizing European conventions of statuary to represent Black women in the public realm. At the August 2020 meeting, the Visual Arts Committee Commission did issue a public apology. I read a statement during the meeting, which was followed by two hours of comments from members of the Bay Area arts community and from artists and arts professionals around the country. Afterward, the San Francisco Arts Commission voted to cease the new 2020 RFQ. That story was covered in the New York Times, which raised national awareness about the fiasco. And that story was also the catalyst for behind the scenes efforts to have my work, my monument, erected in front of the library where it was originally selected for. I eventually met with Mayor Breed, who accepted responsibility for what happened and with Supervisor Stephanie, who both apologized. And finally, last month, the Arts Commission voted to terminate the new 2020 RFQ and to approve the selection panel's near unanimous choice of my proposal. Thanks to the support and activism of the Bay Area arts community and artists and arts professionals around the country, Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman will finally be erected in front of the main library. That justice was served in this case 
speaks to the enduring power of Dr. Angelo's legacy. Each time a woman stands up for herself, without knowing it, possibly without claiming it, she stands up for all women. Maya Angelou. Thank you. Thank you, Lava. That was such a lovely um, presentation. Thank you for your thoughtfulness and for your willingness to share so many aspects um, of what you've been through. And I just, when you were saying that quote, you know, the price is high, but the reward is great. It did make me think of the the price of your your strength and your advocacy and everything that you've been through um, throughout this project. And I just want to you know thank you um, for being here with us and sharing that. Um, I do want to open up for questions uh, from the group. And if there aren't any, I have some that I will ask, but I want to make sure that um, everyone's questions are answered, if that's OK with you, Lava. So maybe, oh, yeah. Robin, you could kick us off, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, well, I want to say thank you so much, Lava. That was a fabulous presentation. And I'm just really proud of your strength. Oh, um, thanks. So what my question to you is, what advice do you have for other female artists? Um, my advice would be to never stop working. Um, never stop working, even if your work isn't getting attention, because you never know when the spotlight will shine on you and you always want to be prepared when opportunities arise. Great. Um, I asked a few of our members to ask a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Oh, Kim Swig, okay. Yes. Robin, you, you told me, I'm, okay. Good. Robin, first, first, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I've always known you were a tremendous artist, but I really didn't understand what an incredible writer you are, an expressive writer. The words you use to convey your thoughts and the history makes you a phenomenal woman, number one. Um, <laughs> truly, truly, you're, you're the, your spoken word is as valuable as the art you do, and I can't wait to see how that progresses as your career goes on. But I have a question in the terms of your fight against the San Francisco Arts Commission. It appeared to me when I'm listening to all this, it is very reflective of the fight of the women that you painted early on holding up their signs. How did that group of previous women and the ones you wrote about, how did that sustain you in your fight and how did that motivate you? Because you were really reflecting their early courage. You know, um... I created that body of work after Trump was elected and I created it so that I would be inspired and to remember that it really was the labor and organizing of everyday women that were able to, um, and working in tandem with the NAACP and working in tandem with other um, community organizations in Montgomery, that they were able to really changed the course of American history. So having gone through that, ex uh, that experience of creating that exhibition and seeing how it was, it was really inspiring to other, well, to viewers of that exhibition and how that project really inspired me. Um, when this happened, I just couldn't back down having taken a real deep dive into the history of the civil rights movement and really uncovering this hidden history of um, black women's activism. Well, I also felt, I also very much felt like, and then when I think about the subject, okay, we're talking about Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was an incredible, incredible woman, as well as an author and poet, she was a champion for justice and an activist and a humanitarian. So while I was going through this process fighting the San Francisco Arts Commission, I really had this feeling like the universe, as difficult as it was, the universe was calling me to step up because I was representing these women in my artwork. I mean, I had to have my own story of fighting for justice in a very real way. I had to feel what some of that was like in order to be worthy to take on these women as subjects in my own work. 
Well, it was fabulous. Yeah, yeah and Lava, I have a question to Susan. Um, just amazing work, amazing work, amazing presentation. I just have chills, thank you. Um, and I want to ask you who you had mentioned just very briefly, Ed Reinhardt, I think Jasper Johns and artists that, uh, but who were, were there certain artists that were your main inspiration or yeah. mentors or? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, when I was in college, I, I wasn't at UCLA, I was an art major and I interned at um, the Getty Institute one summer and I worked in the conservation department. And I thought I would become a conservator because I really loved being around objects. But at the same time, Carrie Mae Weems had an exhibition um, at um, the Getty. And I had the opportunity to spend every day of my internship, which was um, six weeks of the summer uh, with her work. And it was so powerful. And of course, everyone in the in the conservation department was really encouraging, encouraging me to go into conservation because there are so few women of color in the field. And I had, you know, really good facility with my hands and, and I love the work, but her exhibition just blew me away. And her stay, I mean, when you talk about speaking truth to power, Carrie Mae Weems for me is like the ideal. And then a local artist, Mildred Howard has been an incredible friend and mentor. Hung Lu has been an incredible friend and mentor. Oh, fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, we also have a question from Yvonne Nevins. I know she has to jump on to another meeting. So thank you, Yvonne. Thanks, Robin. Um, Lava, you mentioned that you uh, were doing these pandemic portraits and that they were part of a larger project. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the larger project? And also just how big are they? They're not very large. They're um, actually life-size. So the, portrait, the portraits themselves are about like, like this and they're all you know usually I work with um, um, archival photography um, in my practice but these are all imagined they're all created portraits because I don't really have I don't, I don't have access to folks to sit for me and to take photographs of them and I also don't have access to the kind of um, archival photography that would give me a real, you know, straight on. So I'm not really um, using real life subjects, but these are anonymous women that are coming out of my imagination. We have a question coming in from the chat from Lisa who asks, what was the best advice you were given throughout this fight to have your work rightfully recognized and brought back to life? Oh, um, I wasn't really given advice. I mean, some I advice that I got was actually to let it go. I would say, <laughs> you know, let it go. It's not worth it. You're fighting the city. And it wasn't just the city that I was fighting. I mean, this, this fiasco or this, this story has so many levels. And when you start peeling back the layers you discover even more. <laughs> so, you know, I was I was advised, you know, why don't you just let it go? Focus on your practice. Your work is doing, you know, your career is doing well. Blah blah blah. But I could not let it go. And then at the same time, I wouldn't say advice, but I had a lot of support. I mean, the community came out for me. The community came out, and it wasn't just for me. It was because of the outrageousness of having been selected by a panel in a democratic and transparent process, and then having politicians come and undermine it and say, oh no, we want the second place proposal. Now, as artists, we don't have very many guarantees and I'm not an artist who, who teaches, so I don't even have that really to fall back on. The only thing that we rely on and we trust it so much is the integrity of the selection process. When we go there, our politics that go on, you know, behind closed doors, we know that jurors advocate for the artists that they want to receive the reward. 
the, the award, but when that door is closed and that selection is made, that selection is inviolate. That's the only, that's the only professional guarantee that we have. So artists around the country were just outraged that something like this would happen because it me if something like this can happen to me, not that I'm any, any more special than any other artists out there, but if something like this can happen to an artist, it can happen to all of us. And that is really what the community came out to fight against. Great. And it was such a beautiful, um, um, it was such a beautiful, I would say co coalition of disparate communities that came together. It wasn't just black women, it was allies, it was it was the queer community. I mean, it was it was just it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> so I had support, but I wouldn't say so much advice. Hmm. I'm curious, Lava, I mean, through this experience, has this changed how you think of yourself as an activist? I mean, obviously, you've looked at these role models through your work, but I'm curious if it's changed how you think about your role as an artist. Um, in all of this, I, would, I was an activist out of necessity, but I don't think of myself as an activist and actually having gone through this process I don't have the energy and the stamina. It's really, really hard. It's really hard. And it comes with no, you know, nobody's paying you for doing this work. And I'm happiest when I'm in the studio and I'm happiest when I'm uncovering histories of women's activism, um, uncovering the sto these stories who, these stories who haven't, that haven't been told and bringing those stories to the fore through portraiture or other means. That's where I'm happiest, not, you know, fighting a system that, that a powerful system at that. No, I, I'm not trying to make any enemies here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyone Does else? Lorna have a question? It popped over to Lorna, I think. Yeah, I don't, she, she, well, I just I just wanted to make one comment and what a wonderful presentation and what wonderful work. Um, but I just wanted to know among the many supporters, there were many ladies I know in our group that wrote yes. letters and supported you as, as well. So uh, we and thank really, you so much. <laughs> well, we, were, we want you to know we were really cheering you on and so proud of what you were doing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one. Okay. Hey, Lava. Thank Hi, you. Amy. Hi. That was really amazing. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about how you use memory in your work, and I'm seeing it in two ways. So it's your memory, and then there's this there's a collective memory mm -hmm. that could also be you know there's the collective memory of the black women experience and then the black experience. And I'm thinking about that being um, like part of your DNA, like if memory could impact DNA and be passed on, whether it's trauma or, you know, your body remembering, but clearly there's a memory there. And I, I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm, I don't know what the question is exactly, but I guess I want you to talk, I would love for you to talk about collective memory or collective trauma and how you are interpreting it, what came before you, but also including your very own unique experience. Um, in terms of, well, we know through epigenetics that trauma is inherited. Um, through generation, so that's a given. And epigenetics is, is a field that's only about 15 years old, but there's been a lot of research recently that um, just shows how your, your genes change, how trauma affects your genes. When I was, um, 
when I was a student and thinking about being an artist and what my, how I was going to use my voice, I kept going back to my own family. I kept going back to the women in my family, not really understanding why. And whenever I tried to do something more abstract, whenever I tried to think about, so Afro futures, for example, or any of those, I kept going back to the past. And finally, I had to just accept that that was how I was going to use um, um, my art to really look at the past, to uncover these stories and starting with uncovering stories in my own family. So just two, just two years ago, um, I discovered that I am the descendant of an enslaved woman. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that until two years ago. So it makes, for me, it, it, it's almost as if the past, or in my case, the women from my maternal line, and I don't fully understand how this operates. I can only um, allow myself to be a vessel for it, actually. Their voice and their experiences, now is the time for that, that story to come forward. Now is the time for me at this particular time um, in our current history, when you think about Black Lives Matter, when you think about the 1619 Project, when you think about um, um, who is currently sitting <laughs> in the White House, when you think about all these things and how this country is so incredibly polarized, this is a moment for a lot of that history to be revealed. For example, with the Montgomery bus boycott women, I also started, I started creating that work after Trump was elected, but it was leading up to the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, where all of the po popular memory and history around the civil rights movement and all of the thousands of people who participated in that movement and all of the unsung women, women who did all of the like, la real labor and organizing. You just think about how many institutions and organizations are really run by women, mm -hmm. how their stories and that moment in history were coming to the fore through my portraits. I mean, I was just shocked that the Smithsonian invited me <laughs> to give a talk about it. So there's just a lot that I don't fully understand um, and a lot that I can't really, um, I mean, I can't even articulate it. I allow myself, it just, it sounds so like heebie-jeebie-ish, right? But, you know, I have to allow myself to be a vessel for some of these things, but my work is very much rooted in research. So it, it, I'm, I'm sort of led to these different things. I mean, to discover that I'm a descendant of an enslaved woman, and I didn't know this five years ago. Mm -hmm. And to know her name, and to know the name of the woman who owned her. I mean, these are just like kind of amazing things that I am just discovering about my own. Um, lineage. Well, Lava, thank you so much for sharing all of that with today, us today, your generosity and your um, statements. And, you know, Kim is right, you speak so beautifully um, with such passion about all of this. And there's so much to absorb and really think about. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to make sure we thank Eileen for being here. Um, from Nimwa um, on the East Coast. I wanna thank all of our artists who came out in support of their fellow Women to Watch artists. It's so lovely to see all of you um, at these monthly events and stay connected. Um, and I'll pass it over to Robin for our final goodbye or if there's any announcements you wanted to share. Okay. Well, thank you, Jamie and Lava so much. Um, and thank you all of you members for attending this recorded Zoom call. Again, I'll post the link on our Facebook page and I'll put it in our minutes. Um, I would like to remind you that hopefully we'll see all of you on December 14th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for our holiday cocktail hour Zoom meeting. And, and don't forget to make that 
cranberry champagne cocktail. <laughs> um, the recipe is in the email and then we'll be sending you the link shortly to for the Zoom call. If I won't be seeing you next week, please all have a safe and happy holiday. And here's hoping 2021 will look a little brighter. Cheers. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>